As we come to uh, this morning, we're actually going to be starting a new series this morning. We're going to be starting a series on the book of Esther. But before I do that, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, yesterday and just kind of give credit where credit's due. Uh, I went down yesterday with the quizzers to our final quiz meet of the year. And if you don't know anything about Bible quizzing, then some of this may not make sense to you. But uh, I just was so blown away by the way our students in our church have committed the word of to their hearts, and just, it was a wonderful time, and we got to sit there, and uh, Bethany, I I was really proud of my daughter, because, you know, she had this goal of beating her two jumps that she's uh, ever had for a top at a quiz meet, and she got three, and she's so excited, and I told her one more, and she gets ice cream, and she got three more. (laughs) So she said, I owe her a lot of ice cream. (laughs) But it was also awesome to see several, a couple of our students finish in that top 15 in our district, one of them finishing second in our district and on our way to internationals and just. <laughs> but I tell you, the, the thing that I, uh, that I really um, enjoy about going to things like this is I get to sit and visit with our people over a long, long day. I emphasize long. And, uh, and get to hear stories. And so we stopped for dinner on the way home and, and I, I was sitting with um, a Tinker family and if you know anything about them, they have lots of stories, <laughs> always and ever. But I was thinking about it, as we come to this book of Esther, it's, it's another narrative-style uh, book, but one of the things that struck me this week is that we understand life, we process life within the context of story, within narrative. You know, if I come up to you and I say, hey, tell me about yourself, you're probably going to tell me some stories that kind of like define, like show some of the characteristics of who you are or your family. And that's why I I joke, you know, the the Tinker family, I love them to death. You guys are always ready for a laugh. And so they tell stories that involve a lot of humor. Uh, Sometimes, you know, I can't repeat from the pulpit because, you know, (laughs) bathroom humor or whatever. But uh, at the end of the day, I really enjoy it. I enjoy being with people, hearing their story, hearing about them. And we understand life within the context of story. When we talk about scriptural concepts and stuff, we look at what Jesus did in the Bible. He often told parables because the reality, if we just teach hard, just doctrine, just theology, we we as humans sometimes have trouble processing that. But if we teach that in the context of story, We can relate, we connect, and it becomes something that is ingrained in us. And the way God hardwired us as a people is we remember story. And so often we see in parables that Jesus usually would use those, a small, short story to make a main point. Now, you know, that that kind of gives a a context. If you're ever looking at a parable, there's usually one main point. You can't read a lot into all the details. Um, We know in in Scripture we have most of uh, the context of this book that we hold to as the canon of Scripture is stories. And Esther is no different. Now, if you've ever studied Esther, you know there are some interesting problems with the book of Esther that evangelicals don't like. For instance, never in the entire book is the name of God mentioned. Elohim, Yahweh, nothing is in there. The only book in Scripture that does not mention God's name explicitly. Uh, There's connections that we struggle with some of the names, and we know that they give sometimes Hebrew names versus Greek names and those sorts of things, and there sometimes are discrepancies or perceived discrepancies. But one of the big things two evangelicals have with this, if you know anything about the book of Esther, it gets pretty violent at the end. I need to give warning. This is not a PG-13 series. There's a lot of killing that goes on at the end. Lots of slaughter, people dying and getting impaled and those sorts of things. Now for me as a guy who likes action flicks, I'm like, yeah, some blood and gore. (laughs) But the reality is it's a, a book that challenges us. And as I felt led to come to it, I think what God is wanting to do in it is this. We have, Esther is set in the context of a very pagan culture. The Jews have been exiled. They are scattered among the nations. And so they are at the mercy of pagan leadership and a pagan government that does not honor God. And there's no mention of God as far in the book. And so within their context, it becomes a question, how do we live out our faith within the context of a culture that totally denies our faith? And so I think it's a very relevant book for us today. Because this is a world we live in as well. 
Now, as we start to get into it, we need to understand some of the big main points of Esther. It's, again, a story. Uh, we believe it to be a historically accurate story, but it does have a point. And as we work through this book, I hope you catch this, this point again and again. Even though God is not mentioned directly, it points to his sovereignty and his providence, that he is ultimately in control. And so we're going to look at that. Now, as we get ready to jump into that, I actually want to look at a passage in Daniel 4. I think you're going to have to click for me, guys, because it's still not working. In Daniel chapter 4, when King Nebuchadnezzar, if you know anything about the Babylonian Empire as, uh, that originally exiled the Jews, um, King Nebuchadnezzar was a, a pretty fool of himself dude, and the Lord humbled him in a very dramatic way. And after the Lord restored this king, who was not a, you know, a follower of God originally, it says that this is what... Da uh, King Nebuchadnezzar says of God, he says, For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and can, none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? And so the king of the known world at the time said, Nothing man can do can stop the sovereign plan of God. And I think in the context of everything we see in our culture, and our world, this should be something we rest in, that nothing can thwart the will of God. And so to start this, I want to give you some timeline pieces. We need to understand, uh, I, I'm a little bit of a history geek, so I like understanding things in the context of of scriptural timelines, world history. And so let's look at that real quickly. And so, Devin, if you can just keep clicking for me. So we're looking at, first of all, we need to understand some scriptural timeline. We know some things are recorded in Scripture. Um, and in, in Ezra 1, we know that Cyrus, the first real big main king of Persia, the guy that really ruled the known world at the time, he allowed the Jews to return and rebuild the temple in Ezra 1, and that was about 538 uh, B.C., just before that, he had just took over the Babylonian Empire. And this king, Cyrus, actually entered Babylon and took it, the, the, the capital of the Babylonian Empire, without a fight. Because he actually waded up the Euphrates River and the canals, and they came into the city when the king and all of his subjects were in drunken revelry. They was having a party, and they were so plastered they didn't know what was going on, and the king of Babylon took over according to the history records we have. And there's a lot of the Persian records that actually still survive to this day. A lot of what I was reading this week is from, actually, we have some of the annuals of the kings of Persia. You know, we read in, in Scripture, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, that, you know, that for other things that happened in her life, see the annuals of the kings of Judah. We have some of those for the kings of Persia. Actually, one of those is housed in a British museum right now. And so we have a lot of detail. And so... This guy, Cyrus the Great, he takes Babylon. But here's an interesting thing. We can look at that like, okay, so he's a smart uh, guy. He knew how to strategize and take over this empire. But before him, go ahead, Devin. Actually, some 200 years prior, in the book of Isaiah, we see Isaiah the prophet call him by name and speaks of what the Lord is going to do. And so I actually want us to turn there in Isaiah 44 and 45. There's a few things the Lord says about Cyrus. Now, I need to tell you, there are some modern scholars that try to argue that part of Isaiah was written much later because there's no way in the world he could have known about Cyrus. Last I checked, prophecy means you talk to the guy who does. And you hear from him. So I, I think it's fair to say Isaiah wrote this in his time and knew about Cyrus, king of Persia. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you in, from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. He's beginning to make promises and talking to Israel. But he says, who says of Cyrus, in verse 28, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill my purpose. Saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. Now if we move ahead to chapter 45 in verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. Now we need to catch something there. In Scripture, I cannot find any other place where anyone other than the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is called my anointed. 
But we see Isaiah prophesying that the Lord in his sovereignty says, Cyrus, you're mine. You don't know me, but I'm going to use you. He says, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. Sounds like he's going to be pretty victorious. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break into pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no other God. No God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. 200 years before Cyrus is on the scene, before the Persian Empire is anything, Isaiah pens these words from the Lord. He says, listen, I have looked forward in a time. I have chosen this man, though he will not know me. I will use him to further my kingdom on this earth. That should give us incredible hope. I mean, the Scripture has told us to pray for our leaders, and we definitely should. But there are times, if they will not acknowledge God, He can and still will use them to His purposes. He is sovereign and in control. And so we see, uh, let's go back to this timeline here, that, so Isaiah prophesies about it, and actually in, in Ezra chapter 1, Cyrus sends the Jews back to rebuild the temple, just like Isaiah talked about. And that decree actually in the front of Esther, I don't have it on the screen, or sorry, Ezra, is quite interesting because it, it says of, of Persia, he says, the Cyrus king of Persia says this, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. This is a pagan king who did not follow the Lord, but he was so touched by the hand of the Lord, so recognized that it had to be God that gave it to him. And so his first thing he does within his first year says, Jews, go back. Start building your temple and I'll fund it. That kind of sounds like our story about the Great Commission Fund, Right? God will fund that which he chooses. He has the cattle on a thousand hills, and here he says, I want my temple rebuilt, and this rich empire is going to fund it. And we're going to get into, as we start the book of Esther, we will realize how very rich they were. And so we see, though, that his uh, successor, Artaxerxes, actually stops the building in Ezra chapter 4. So we, we, we talked about, we did a series on, the, on Nehemiah, and we talked about Esther and Nehemiah, kind of Ezra, sorry, Ezra and Nehemiah, try to kind of go together. In Ezra chapter 4, we see some troublemakers, they sent a letter, hey, this Jerusalem, this city was, you know, they've caused trouble in the past, and the king, the next king, stops it. But then his successor, Darius, in Ezra 5 and 6, goes back, uh, they write a letter and say, hey, Cyrus told us we could do this, and he says, sure did, and he begins to fund the rebuilding of the temple. And so by then, uh, we're moving sometime after 530. Go ahead, Devin. So moving forward, the temple is completed in Ezra 6, and we know that it was about 516 B.C. So we see the timeline's progressing, and if you ever read the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, you, you think that there's kind of a flow there. They kind of go together, and at one point they were one compiled text. But here's the issue. that we actually, if, if we look in between Ezra 6 and Ezra 7, there's actually a huge jump in time. You would not know it by reading the scripture, but by dates given and such, we know there's a, a time jump. And so, go ahead, Devin. So Ezra is actually sent to Jerusalem in Ezra 7, about 458 B.C. So there's a significant jump in time now. And then after Ezra, we know that Nehemiah was sent to Jerusalem about 445 B.C. Now why is all that relevant? The book of Esther, although it appears after these in your Bible falls right in between there. King Xerxes, which we will see in a moment, and Esther, his queen, fall right in the middle at 486 to 465. So the book of Esther could, if you have a chronological Bible, it probably places it between Ezra 6 and Ezra 7. So that's where we're at. 
The Jews have been exiled. At the start of this, they've been exiled for 47 years before Cyrus sends the first of them back. So they, you know, if you know anything about the history, they disobeyed, disobeyed, disobeyed. God first took um, Israel away and exiled them. Then he took Judah. And then now at this point in history, they're all away. And at this point in history, there are, are two main empires in the world. We need to get our world history straight. We have the Persian Empire. Big stuff. Obviously affecting God's people. The other empire that has risen at this time is actually Greece. is in its golden age. And the Persian Empire and the Greek Empire, they're at each other. They're the two world powers that are constantly fighting. So, as we look at this time period in, in history, the world, what they saw, they didn't think about this little place of Jerusalem or this dispersed people called the Jews. The world's focus was on the Persian Empire versus the Greek Empire. And they were fighting constantly. The Persian kings poured all of their wealth into this, these invasions into Greece. And at the same time, in Greece, in Athens, was developing this concept of democracy. And it was beginning to become fulfilled. In the same time uh, throughout the world, as we understand, uh, the Chinese philosopher Confucius was born. Socrates was born. Pythagoras established his school of religion and philosophy, which eventually came out of that, the Pythagorean theorem. The Olympic Games were already 150 to 200 year, years old in Athens at this point. So the world is looking everywhere else. And as we look at Scripture, we look at the Old Testament, one of the ways I explain it to people, this is not just history. This is God's commentary on history. And God is saying in the midst of when the world is focused on all these big things, God says, my people and what I'm doing within them. That is what I want recorded for all of time. Now this should give us great hope because in the midst of all the stuff in our country and in our world, we could feel really small. But at the end of the day, our God says, what I'm doing amongst my people, that is what matters. And that is why the book of Esther is so important to us. So, let's look at Esther chapter 1. And we're going to read the first nine verses. Now, this isn't going to seem drastically exciting to you as far as uh, theological content, but just follow along with me. Now, in the days of... All right. I've tried five times in my office this morning again. I have to rest. Why do you come do it? <laughs> All right. The Asterisk who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. Now, right away, we need to understand something. The annuals of the Persian kings do not ever indicate anything like 127 provinces. The, they had these large groups. There were like 20. But Daniel also indicates in the Persian Empire something like this. And so we think these provinces, the author was writing, like these are smaller geographical areas. There's 127 little small areas that like, like Jerusalem and Judah would kind of fall under like one of those areas, the kingdom of Israel. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. And we're going to later start calling him Xerxes because that's what his uh, Greek name is. The armies of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of all the provinces were before him while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days. 180 days. I hope you get this. The dude threw a six-month party to show how awesome he was. <laughs> one commentator said, said I wonder what he was compensating for inside of his heart did he think really little of himself <laughs> and so he's got to show it out but here's the deal he was compensating for something in his heart so he's literally throwing out this massive party but we need to understand this in the context of world history the first readers of the book of Esther would have understood something four years after this King Xerxes takes off and invades Greece and fails miserably. And that campaign cost him the vast majority of his wealth. So the early readers of the book of Esther would have looked at this as a bit ironic. Look at him, he's throwing this like party and showing off. 
And he's about to be broke because he utterly failed and was defeated. But what he's doing, he's gathered all these provincial leaders. Think about it. They have, the Babylonian Empire went out and they just took over mass, mass areas. And they, they shucked people around so they would lose their sense of nationalism and they wouldn't want to come rise up and defend their homeland and stuff. And when King Cyrus comes in, not only did he send the Jews back, he sent a lot of the peoples back because he understood something. If I win their hearts a little bit, it'll be a little bit easier to manage them. And so he sends Cyrus and the Persian kings generally sent people back and rebuilt cities to try to establish these outposts. But they have this massive empire with many nations that they've conquered, multiple languages, and to try to go to war, he can't just keep going to war with the original like Persian area. He needs their help. So he throws this party to show how awesome he is so that these people will come to war with him. And that's actually what this party's all about. We know that the Medes uh, and the Persians used to be kind of at each other. Now they're all together in one empire. And so he's trying to woo them and trying to like, listen, look how awesome I am. I'm about to go win. Why don't you come join me? Bring your people. Six-month party. Woo! Our church potlucks ain't got nothing on him. It goes on to tell us this. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa, the citadel. So this is one of the capitals. They actually had a couple capitals because Susa was really uh, miserable sometimes of the year as far as the temperatures, and so um, they actually kind of moved around. But both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So after the six-month party where everyone's going around just having a good time, like the grandest vacation you can imagine. Now they have a seven-day feast. Now, we're getting ready to go to council, and uh, one of the things that we've already talked about doing is at some point we're going to get an Uber, we're going to go to like a Walmart or something, we're going to get us some food. Because we're at a Marriott, and all there is is like sit-down restaurants. And that sounds wonderful until you get to about meal three. And then you get really sick, and you can't eat that much. And you're like, I just, I mean, I'd be happy with like a banana right now and an apple, you know? And you can't get that, right? So we will, we're going to Uber to a Walmart. We're going to get some stuff, throw it in our fridge in our hotel room, and that'll be some of our meals because we're going to get tired of it. Can you imagine, you know, I, I, I like to go to buffets sometimes. Um, I realize that it's not good for my figures, so I don't do that very often. But the reality is that we could go to like a buffet, and it's really exciting. But if you do that at breakfast, you're not really hungry at lunch, are you? And they have a seven-day party. Imagine all you can eat buffet for seven days. I, I hate to imagine the weight they put on. Let's be honest. I mean, I look at the turkey on Thanksgiving and I gain three and a half pounds. Seven days of this. Wow. And he's, again, throwing out this stuff to try to impress these people. Then it tells us about his king's, this palace. You know, it was seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violent hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars. I mean, this stuff is expensive back then. And it's about to get really expensive. And also couches of gold and silver. I don't know about you, but like my couch came from this place like called American Freight where things are really cheap dude's got a gold couch a gold couch you got nothing better to do with your money but to buy a gold couch I can think of a lot better things to do with my money but he literally has a gold couch okay and and it tells us all these things couches of gold and silver on a mosaic payment a periphery marble mother pearl and precious stones so they the floor is precious stones He's living it up. Drinks were served in golden vessels. Vessels of different kinds. And the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. Now this is really sounding like when Babylon lost the empire. Drunken revelry. And drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion. For the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Open bar. For seven days. That's what we're talking about. Let's say this is not a PG-13 book. They have an open bar for seven days. They're all getting drunk. 
They're all just wandering around, drinking out of their you know, expensive gold cups and all these things, sitting on their gold couches and walking around on the precious stones and just living it up. And then Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to the king. So we, this is our first introduction of King Vashti. But at the end of the day, what does all this mean? What does this have for us? At the beginning of this, we need to understand this right here is the world's focus. The world knows Persia's going after Greece again. And anybody in the Persian Empire knows this party, which goes on for six months. So even before Facebook, let's be honest, everybody knew about the party that's going on up in Susa. It is the party. I mean, it's the party of the year because it lasted half the year. So they're up partying away and all this to garner support for this massive push to go back against Greece and to try to expand their empire. This is where the world is focused. And in this introduction, God would say to us as people, this stuff doesn't matter. We get this introduction to Queen Vashti. And next week, (laughs) some of you are going to like, Pastor, you're either brave or stupid. Next week, we're going to talk about Vashti's refusal to be paraded in front of the guys on Mother's Day. I'm probably more stupid than brave, but we'll go with it. But we're going to talk about what <laughs> we're going to talk about that on Mother's Day. Ladies, at least I'm not going Proverbs 31 on you, all right? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I've heard that a few times. But we're going to look at this and we're going to begin to look at God sets into motion a series of events, including this. This party is the beginning of a series of events. He's drunk, he's full of himself, the king, and he's about to ask his queen to come parade herself in front of his guest. Unveiled is the term. You can read all you want into that, because it means exactly that. He wanted to show off his hot wife to all of his drunken buddies. That's what we're going to get into next week. But God sets into motion this party which causes him to make a bad Uh, request of his wife which causes her to rebel which causes her to be kicked out and will eventually lead to one of God's people a lady named Esther being queen of most of the known world and so I want to encourage you as we look even just at this introduction and as we look at the whole book What the world says is important. The big happenings, all the stuff that we need, it calls, it cries to us constantly in our news feeds on Facebook and on on the television. And everywhere we look, calls to these things, these are the things you need to be worried about. And God says, my commentary on history has nothing to do with most of that. In fact, I'm actually using all of that to work my purposes in my people. And that is exciting, great news. Because I don't know about you, I get sick when I look around this world. I am amazed at the depravity I see and the nasty evil that runs runs rampant. At the end of the day, this book is about this. God is sovereign over all that. And if you are his, you ain't got nothing to worry about, friends. All you English teachers would be like, Pastor, just use ain't in this sermon. I know, my English teacher you say ain't in a word, so. But friends, let me encourage you. Let us trust in the sovereign God whose providence overrules all the things that this world has to throw. Amen?